Let's turn to Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what Jesus cried out just before he died on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't because Jesus himself had any sin of his own that God forsook him at that moment. It was because Jesus had taken our sins, my sins and your sins upon himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus became a mass of sin in our place. Jesus took all of our sins upon himself. And so for a short time, he was forsaken by God. For a short time, God forsook him. I should have been forsaken by God. But Jesus took my sin upon himself. And therefore, he was forsaken like that in my place. If the people of this world are not saved, after they have lived their lives, the moment they fall into hell, this is what they will cry out. The moment a person is cast into hell is the moment he is forsaken by God eternally, forever and ever. He is forsaken forever. That is really terrible, isn't it? Hell is the moment you are cut off from God, forever and ever. It is being forsaken eternally. A person who isn't saved will end up like that eternally. He'll be thrown into hell forever. But since Jesus took our sins upon himself, he was forsaken by God. So if you believe that Jesus took your sins upon himself, and therefore he was forsaken by God, and now you are not forsaken, that is faith. That is faith. The moment that we were cast into hell, we would have cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Jesus cried those words out in our place. So now, if we believe this fact and accept it in our hearts, now we won't have to cry out these words ourselves. Why? Because Jesus has taken our sins upon himself. So, it says the Lord shall not impute my sin, right? Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Look what it says here. Please repeat after me. Who was delivered up because of our offenses. Do you know where he was delivered up? Do you know where he was delivered up? It looks like you don't know. Jesus didn't go to hell, did he? He was delivered up to death, to the cross. Look what it says here. It says it very clearly. Repeat after me. Who was delivered up because of our offenses? Since Jesus bore our sins in our place, he was delivered up to die. He was delivered up to death. That's what happened, isn't it? So Jesus took the full responsibility for all of our sins. You don't have to take responsibility for them. Now look what it says next. Repeat after me. And was raised because of our justification. It's true that this is quite difficult to understand. But if you think about it very carefully, these words may seal your fate. Jesus. Jesus died on the cross, and then he was buried in the tomb like this. It looks like someone lying down, doesn't it? Jesus. The tombs of the Jews didn't look like this, but Jesus was buried in a tomb. He was buried because he bore our sins upon himself and died. And so he was buried like this in the tomb. Jesus bore our sins upon himself and was buried like this. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead, these sins couldn't be raised from the dead with him. These sins weren't resurrected with him. These sins remained buried in the tomb. These sins remained buried in the tomb. And Jesus alone rose from the dead. Jesus alone rose from the dead. The sins remained buried, and Jesus alone rose from the dead. This was in order that we might be justified. Why is that? Now our sins are buried. Our sins have disappeared. Jesus' resurrection establishes the fact that the problem of our sins has been solved. Jesus' new life was in this resurrection. New life. New life. He rose to new life. 
not a life of sin. He rose to a new life. And therefore, this new life is a righteous life. This new life is a righteous life. Since he rose to a righteous life, he also rose from the dead for our sake. If we believe this new life in Jesus' resurrection, this righteous new life becomes mine. It enters into me. This new life comes into the believer. When it comes, you don't suddenly have a tingling feeling all over. You don't start trembling. It doesn't come like that. When you simply believe, it has come to you. Jesus died in my place, and he rose again three days later. Those who believe this in their hearts already have this new life within them, and so they are righteous. I don't know whether you believe this or not. It is up to you. Now look at chapter 5, verse 1. Repeat after me. Therefore, you will be justified by faith. What does it say? You are very clever. Therefore, having been justified by faith. So if we believe, we are automatically justified. This is God's righteousness. God's righteousness. God has carried out his research very well, hasn't he? If he hadn't done all of this, how would any of us as sinners dare to stand before God? And how would we ever be able to be saved, even in our wildest dreams? But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God justifies the ungodly. God justifies the sinner. So since the truth of the Bible is God's word, we only need to accept it and believe it. It's not something to examine logically. Now, let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. If you look at this verse, perhaps in the past you lived a life of faith, attending church. Take a look at what it says here. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. People who are still trying to keep the law have not yet received faith. That is not faith. The Bible talks about the law. There is the law in the Bible. But a person who is making every effort to keep that law doesn't yet have faith. Once you believe, you are freed from the law. Believing means being freed from the law. If you try to keep the law, you find that you commit sins. And you commit sin after sin after sin. But then when you come to realize what Jesus did for you, you are freed from that sin. You are saved from your sin. So now you are no longer under the law, are you? And therefore, the life of faith is not one of keeping the law. Now let's read it again. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. What is this faith which should afterwards be revealed? It doesn't mean having a revelation while you are praying. When the Bible talks about faith that is revealed, it is a matter of coming to realize the truth. The Bible itself is a revelation. And when I realize the truth in these words of revelation in my heart, then I receive this faith that is revealed. You have to understand something. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. The seed that was sown by the wayside represents those who hear the word and do not understand what it is saying. When this happens, the wicked one comes and snatches it away. You need to come to understand the words of the Bible. And coming to this understanding is receiving faith by revelation. We are only under the law until faith comes. But once we come to understand and faith comes, we are no longer under the law. We are freed from the law.